Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Lynette Averill will present Searching for Biomarkers of Stress-Related Mental Illness and Suicidality. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $394 million to fund more than 5,700 grants to over 4,700 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Lynette Averill. Dr. Averill is Assistant Professor in Psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine and Research Psychologist at the National Center for PTSD. She was a Foundation Young Investigator grantee in 2015. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Averill's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel of your screen. Feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I will ask as many possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Averill. Lynette, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me just get my screen up here. Perfect. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Borenstein, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the Brain and Behavior Foundation for this really incredible opportunity to share some of my work with such a broad audience. I think it's somewhat of a rare privilege to be able to speak with some of my colleagues, other clinicians and investigators at the same time as I'm able to speak to community members, to consumers, to patients, family members and loved ones of people who may be struggling with some of the things that I'll talk about today. And also talking to philanthropists and donors, people who support the Brain and Behavior Foundation and through that support, my own work and that of my mentors and colleagues, and also some of my own family and friends, um, some of my own staff members who have probably called in today. It's just really exciting to be here, really an honor and a privilege. So thank you so much. I think that doesn't seem to be advancing. Let's see. Uh, just click one more time on the slide. Just one more time on the slide. Just one more time. There we go. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> so just as a, um, in terms of disclosures, I, I have no conflicts of interest, nothing to disclose, uh, other than to say that my opinions are my own. Everything presented today um, is is simply my own and not necessarily um, the opinion of the Department of Veterans Affairs, Yale University, Brain and Behavior Foundation, or any of the other organizations that provide support um, for my work. Because this webinar is, <clears throat> excuse me, part of a Meet the Scientist series, I wanted to take just a very brief moment to introduce myself a little bit beyond simply the affiliations that uh, Dr. Bornstein kindly presented already to tell you kind of what my journey has been here, why I do this work, and really why it is not simply a paycheck for me, but a bit of a, a passion project and, and a labor of love, if you will. Um, here are some admittedly <laughs> rather blurry photos um, of my father. The one in the middle, um, he is in his dress uniform um, for the US Marine Corps. The photo on the right was taken during his service in Vietnam, and on the left is a picture of him taken in Montana with uh, his Corvette that I quite regrettably did not get to inherit. Um, 
I, I put these up because um, my father and his brother, my uncle, uh, both served in Vietnam. My uncle died in country, and my father died by suicide when I was three years old after struggling for many years with PTSD, associated depression, and substance use. And though I have absolutely no memory of my father whatsoever, certainly his life and subsequent deaths have shaped the course of my life, both personally and professionally. I grew up in very rural Montana where, where many people served in the, in the military and many people continue to serve. Um, and many people in my family on both my mother and father's side serve and continue to serve. Um, and aside from military service though, uh, rural Montana, like many places in the world, could be a somewhat harsh and unforgiving landscape at times with, with a lot of exposure to trauma um, and extreme stress very limited access to mental health care, and a great deal of stigma around mental illness. So I grew up very aware of the, the costs of trauma and stress, not only on the individual themselves who experiences that, but also on the loved ones, friends, and really the community at large who also, in a way, experiences those things in parallel. Um, and so really, really from a very young age, was just interested in the effects of stress and trauma and kind of why some people are more resilient than others, what are risk factors, what are protective factors, what is underlying neurobiology, what is happening in the body, and importantly, how can we treat these things? How can we help people to live better lives, knowing that there isn't any sort of magic fairy dust that could take away a traumatic experience and in fact, most people have said they wouldn't necessarily want that, even if that was an option. So how do, how do we help people to cope with these symptoms? How do we improve lives? And how do we save lives, ultimately? And not just how do we save lives, but how do we, we as a field, as a community, as a provider, as a, a partner, a parent, a friend, um, a sibling, how do we help to promote and help people create lives that really want to be lived. So I think that it will not take much convincing for, for this group and probably most groups um, to know that, that trauma is bad. Trauma is not something that we go, go out seeking. Um, and I found this quote recently that I, I really found to be kind of poignant. Um, because I think it really highlights that, that life is trauma, that, that trauma knows no bounds, and even the most privileged among us may experience a traumatic event at some point in our lives. And we know that exposure to traumatic experiences leads to any number of things, um, including PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and even suicidality. Um, of course, today's talk really will focus on PTSD and suicidality. So I'm gonna talk just very briefly about the prevalence of PTSD. So PTSD, I can tell you that the average US adult population, approximately 8% of those at some point in their lives will meet criteria for PTSD. So will be exposed to a traumatic event and then we'll meet criteria for an actual diagnosis. The challenge with that is that that 8% really is not at all an accurate representation of what PTSD looks like out in the wild, if you will. Um, we know that there are some populations, some groups of people who are exposed to trauma at significantly greater at events um, or significantly greater um, rates. Military veterans, for example, um, depending on your uh, era of service and what your job was and things, can have rates of PTSD as high as 40%. So definitely not a um, equal distribution here between the general population and military veterans. And among other populations that are um, exposed to traumatic events, um, Refugees, for example, can have rates of PTSD as high as 86%. Now that is a 
really startling number, 86%. If we think about a refugee community and nearly every single member of that community meeting criteria for PTSD, I think is, is really a startling thing. Um, so likely everyone on the call has a, at least a relative sense of what PTSD is um, in terms of the symptom set. But just so all of us are kind of on the same page, I'm going to very briefly go through these um, based on the DSM-5 criteria. And the DSM-5, in case anyone is not as familiar, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And it's really the handbook that provides all of the diagnostic criteria for any sort of mental health diagnosis. So for PTSD, these include re-experiencing symptoms. So the intrusive thoughts, the nightmares, flashbacks. Um, feeling emotionally distressed, or even having a physiological response when you have a reminder, noticing that your heart rate increases, you feel sweaty, you feel tense, you clench your fists, you clench your jaw, those sorts of things. Um, avoidance symptoms. Generally, people try to avoid things that remind them of a traumatic event. So may avoid specific people, places, things, and also avoid internal reminders, trying to avoid um, thoughts or feelings about a traumatic event. Negative mood and cognition refers to a bit of an array of things that include, of course, the sort of depressive-like symptoms, just generally the low mood, um, feeling like you can't experience positive emotions, but also sometimes an exaggerated sense of blame either toward the self or others for what happened. Um, guilt, shame, those sorts of things are also very common. <clears throat> And then hyperarousal, so that sense of, of hyperarousal itself, always feeling like you need to be watchful, always feeling like you need to be on guard, um, an exaggerated startle response, poor sleep. So even in the absence of nightmares, people often report having trouble falling or staying asleep, um, anger and irritability, <clears throat> all of these sorts of things fall into the hyperarousal category. And then there's also a subtype of PTSD called the dissociative subtype, and I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about this in today's presentation, but just want to note the dissociative subtype, which really just entails um, if individuals have experiences of derealization or depersonalization, so experiences where they feel like they're sort of in a dreamlike state or that things around them are not real, um, and people who endorse these kinds of symptoms are at increased risk for comorbid depression, anxiety, more severe substance use, and much more uh, frequent and severe suicidal ideation and rates of attempt. So suicidality, I think of almost as a, a meta symptom, if you will, of PTSD. Um, suicidality in and of itself is not a symptom specifically of PTSD, nor depression, nor anxiety, or anything. Um, it also isn't actually a diagnosis, a standalone diagnosis. And certainly we know that suicidality relates to and is strongly correlated to PTSD and depression and other things. It also though, relates to this huge long list here of, of sort of associated symptoms. These are often baked right into PTSD and depression, but not necessarily. So, you know, as we look through this list, hopelessness, worthlessness, thwarted belonging, stress, tiredness, fatigue, guilt, shame, anger, all of these things are sometimes the reason that people may experience suicidal thoughts or that they may make an attempt. And suicide is, overall, you may hear the term that it is a low base rate occurrence, meaning that Given the entire population of people in the United States or the entire population of people in the world, generally a relatively low number of people experience this. However, that does not mean that it is not at absolutely epidemic proportions and is a public health crisis. So really every organization in the world that has even the slightest tie to suicide prevention efforts has really worked diligently and I think done really incredible work for, for decades really. Um, and unfortunately, despite these efforts, suicide rates have continued to increase annually. And this is some data from the CDC that just shows 
a very unfortunate gradual increase year to year um, as we go. And this um, stopped in 2015, but the rates unfortunately have continued on the same trajectory increasing each year. So where, where does suicide at this point in terms of some of the numbers? Globally, around 800,000 individuals a year die by suicide. That is approximately one death every 40 seconds, which is, again, a very staggering number. Um, within the United States itself, that number is around 129 people per day. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States across all age groups. Um, and in 2016, it took the stage as the second leading cause of death for ages 10 through 34, and the fourth leading cause of death for ages 35 through 54. And again, I just, I feel really taken aback by those numbers that of all of the ways that human beings can find their ultimate end, if you will, all of the ways that human beings can die, the second and fourth leading cause of death for such a huge group of the population is by one's own hand. So that suggests there is an incredible amount of work to be done. Similar to PTSD, where there is not an equal distribution of, of prevalence, the same is seen in suicidality. There are some groups that are at significantly elevated risk. Um, certainly minority groups, we know that um, people who identify as sexual minorities are at increased risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We know that veterans are at elevated risk. Um, I think the, the numbers suggest 1.5 to 2 times the risk of a member um, in the general population. Um, sort of keeping in mind those numbers also include individuals with bipolar disorder are approximately 5 times the risk um, to die by suicide as a member of the general population. And when we consider these sorts of numbers and statistics, um, it's also important to think that, that this also includes healthy individuals where there's kind of zero risk. Generally, someone who is quote unquote perfectly healthy, if such a thing exists, doesn't really have much risk for suicide. But there are really quite significant um, differences in the distribution of risk across different groups. The other thing that's really important to note is that death by suicide, as absolutely horrific and staggering as those numbers are, is, is not the only problem, um, is, a, is a huge and significant problem. And the number of deaths by suicide is is again a relatively small number in comparison to the number of people who attempt suicide, which again is a relatively small number in comparison to the number of people who seriously consider making an attempt at suicide. So this graph just is a, is a very sort of quick image to show that it's estimated that approximately 1.3 million adults attempt suicide um, and almost 2.8 million make some sort of suicide plans but then do not attempt. And almost 10 million adults seriously consider committing suicide even though they do not take any steps. And a couple of things I really want to point out about this graph is the word adults. This does not include any adolescents, any children at all. This is only adults, and I believe this is 21 and over, actually, um, which suggests there is a very large number of our young folks who are not included in these numbers. And unfortunately, we know that, that adolescents and, and even younger children are, are unfortunately dying by suicide and experiencing suicidal thoughts. Um, and suicidal behaviors at, at quite alarming rates. So, so we talked a bit about trauma exposure. We talked about the things that it can, can cause. And all of those things on, kind of relate to problems then with 
with family relationships, with romantic relationships, with parenting, with friends, employment, education, self-care, all of these kinds of things, which kind of have this snowball effect, which then as we go back to suicidality again, thinking about if all of those things in your life are disrupted, it makes sense. It's, it's understandable to see how someone might experience these sorts of emotional states. Um, and similarly, if you're feeling these kinds of ways, it makes sense and is understandable how all of those things could very easily become impacted. So the other thing that we know, not only are there all of these behavioral changes that happen, all of these, all of these things that happen on a behavioral level, we have in the last couple of decades um, really been able to discover that there are also neurobiological changes. And um, a veteran that I worked with um, actually shared this quote with me a while ago that I think is, is, is quite profound. There are wounds that never show on the body that are deeper and more hurtful than anything that bleeds. And I think that really highlights the invisible wounds that are often caused by trauma exposure, that, that you may not see those things when you look at someone. You may not see a wound or a cast or a bandage, but that does not mean that the, that the injuries are not there. So as we think about these wounds, specifically these brain-based changes, I wanna talk really about three regions of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala and the hippocampus. So oops. the prefrontal cortex, um, just very briefly, is kind of the brain region we use to regulate emotion and to choose an action. Kind of helps us with our decision making. Um, the amygdala really focuses on fear learning and processing. And the hippocampus is the part of our brain that we use to sort of interpret emotional context. People often also think of the hippocampus as kind of the learning and memory part of the brain, um, which I think relates to the emotional context and that what we remember about an experience or an event or a person is going to influence the way that we interpret the event. So within our own research program, we've, we've done a lot of work um, and certainly many of our colleagues now and, and across the years have done a lot of work. And these three brain regions are really the most consistent findings within PTSD. That's not to say that there are not many other brain regions that have been implicated in PTSD, but these are really the most common. And just very briefly, um, from our own group, um, Chris Averill did some work, um, led, led some work that was looking at hippocampal um, subfield volume loss in combat veterans and found that both PTSD and depression symptom severities were associated with different um, subfields of hippocampal volume loss. And this is just a graph showing the HATA, which is a specific region of the hippocampus, um, is associated with PTSD severity such that as PTSD severity increases, the brain volume of this particular region decreases. Um, these are a couple of images, and I apologize, there was a little more information here, but um, these are just a couple of images um, that are led by uh, Teddy Akiki, who was a recent postdoc in our group um, that was looking at both hippocampal um, and amygdala changes in the brain, um, also in a group of combat veterans um, with PTSD. Um, the other thing that we've explored a little bit in our group, and I apologize, this is significantly blurry, um, but is cortical thickness. And what cortical thickness is really is kind of just as it sounds, but um, also is a little hard to, to grasp, at least was for me initially. Um, but cortical thickness really just refers to how thick the cortex of the brain is. So this image sort of shows this weird little extraction of, of a piece of the brain and shows the cortex there. And if that spins, generally that is the result of some sort of injury or insult. Um, and what we found in PTSD um, is that 
there are changes in cortical thickness. These little blue blobs that you see across this um, brain image show areas where people with PTSD show significantly decreased thickness of the cortex relative to individuals who do not have PTSD. And this does seem to be based on PTSD severity. So the more severe the PTSD, the greater the cortical spinning. Um, interestingly, we also see this even more in suicidality in PTSD. So this is some pilot data that we have that is a sample of individuals with PTSD. And here, the little blobs that you see are sections where people endorsed having suicidal ideation relative to those who said they never ever have had even the slightest whisper or thought. And if you notice here, my, oops, my cursor isn't working, but um, the regions that are implicated, really if you look at the, the LH lateral, that's left hemisphere lateral, it's really highlighting the prefrontal cortex area predominantly, which um, if we think about that image that I showed initially, really is sort of that that decision-making piece. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that suicidality relates to impaired decision-making and executive functioning. So these findings seem really well in line with that. Um, going back to this image again, um, as we think about function of the brain. So what I've said so far really relates to the structure, the anatomy of the brain, the shape, the size, the thickness of different brain regions. Um, we found that PTSD and um, extreme stress also impact the way the brain functions, not only its size and shape. So again, thinking about the prefrontal cortex is kind of relating to potentially inappropriate persistent fear, decision-making based on that <clears throat> sense of fear, the amygdala relating to heightened fear and threat processing, um, and the hippocampus relating to kind of impaired adaptive fear learning and extinction. So this is an image um, uh, from a paper that was led by Ali Naguria, one of the other postdocs in our group, um, and my colleague Chaudi Abdallah, who they looked at really all of the task-based studies that have happened in PTSD and what sort of which brain regions were found. And as you can see looking at this, as I have mentioned before, there are a lot of brain regions beyond simply the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus that are associated with PTSD. And something that's interesting and a bit of a challenge is that you can also see some of these brain regions have both increases and decreases. So, so there's not necessarily a perfectly clear and coherent story that says absolutely in this brain region there are only increased activation or decreased activation. And that's a challenge that we continue to work on, certainly in our group and I think across the field, is sort of a challenge that relates to the heterogeneity of the PTSD diagnosis and kind of how, how complicated the diagnosis is and how there are some challenges in diagnosing based strictly on behaviors, which I will say a little bit more about. So this is um, some work, again, that I won't really go into much detail on, but looking at what we call global brain connectivity or GBC. So how, how connected different aspects of the brain are. And we think about the brain often from, from sort of the idea of networks, that there are perhaps these different grouping of brain regions that have specific jobs and specific things that they do, and how do these relate? And we find that in PTSD, under symptom provocation, these different networks do show changes in function. Um, we also see that when we look specifically at the symptom clusters of PTSD. So we can see different function specifically based or specifically associated with numbing symptoms, with avoidance, with arousal. Um, and we don't see as much with re-experiencing, 
Um, but it's, I think, very interesting to note that, that you can actually see some changes based on uh, the symptom clusters. And again, we also see this in suicidality in PTSD. So this suggests that there is something unique about suicidal thoughts and behaviors above and beyond simply a PTSD diagnosis, a depression diagnosis, any of those things. Um, when I started this, this particular study um, not too long ago, I was somewhat struck to find that there is really very little neuroimaging research that is specifically looking at PTSD and suicide. There is thankfully a, a, a vast amount of research in PTSD and depression in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Um, but unfortunately, at the time I looked, I believe that there were nine studies total and only two of those actually had suicide and PTSD as a primary aim. So to have these findings and to be able to to be doing this work right now is, I think, a really exciting thing and, and certainly a very important thing given the considerable prevalence rates in both suicide and PTSD. So the dots that you are looking at here represent specific networks in the brain. Um, and these, again, are showing places where individuals with PTSD who endorse suicidal ideation showed changes in the brain relative to those people with PTSD who did not endorse suicidal ideation. Um, and these include specifically, I won't go into any detail about these, but three networks of the brain, which we refer to as the default mode network, which is thought to be at, excuse me, thought to be active during times of rest. So if you are not actually engaged in any sort of specific task, we would think that the default mode network may come online. Um, in PTSD, it's possible that this is potentially impaired because of the continual, or the propensity anyway, for continual intrusive thoughts and memories and these sorts of things, um, that there may not be quite the default that other individuals may have. The salience network, um, which refers or which kind of helps us to determine what in our environment is salient, what things should we pay attention to, what things should we focus on and process. Um, and again, from a PTSD perspective, with hyperarousal, it, it may be challenging to effectively determine what is salient if there is the heightened arousal, the heightened sense of fear and threat. Um, and finally is the central executive network, which, um, really focuses on sort of the prefrontal, where, um, where I had mentioned is really the executive functioning, sort of that higher order decision making, these kinds of things. And also from not only the PTSD perspective, but again, from the suicidality perspective, if you feel that you can never shut off your brain, so to speak, you can never have that just sort of silence, that quiet, that just daydream for a minute experience that you are constantly in fear and feeling threatened and that you may have impaired decision making and impulsivity in these things. All of those things, unfortunately, are likely a very effective cocktail to lead to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, and I got ahead of myself and talked about the networks and then have this slide, so I won't really spend much time here, but this is just sort of showing um, the brain regions associated with the three slides that I just showed. So again, the central executive network, um, the default mode, and the salience network. So I've, I've talked a lot about PTSD and suicide and a bit about the, the neuroimaging findings that we have there. And want to shift gears a little bit, um, sort of take a step back and, and look at the, the forest for the trees, if you will. Um, and what does this tell us and what can we do with it? So something that we spend a lot of time considering um, in our group is how do we actually think about psychopathology standards? How do we diagnose? And are we doing the things that are most helpful? Is there something else that we could be doing or should be doing? So up until now and, and still continuing now, really all mental health diagnostics have been solely based on behavior. Um, and that 
that is valuable and that behaviors are easy to measure, well, relatively easy to measure perhaps compared to some other things. The challenge with diagnosing and treating based on behavior is, as I mentioned earlier, the extreme heterogeneity. And what I mean by heterogeneity is that human beings are really complex and really unique and individual. And I think there are a couple of papers, one by Richard Bryant, I think one by um, Isaac Lertner-Levy and other folks um, who talk about, I don't remember the exact number, so don't quote me on this, something like 300,000 different ways that one could meet the PTSD diagnosis. And that that is a really, really large number if we think about you know some sort of algorithm for deciding what treatment to give someone or something how do you possibly decide what's best with 300,000 options how do you is a challenge to decide what's best if you have five options or ten um, so something that we consider is is there a way um, to shift more toward a model that would look at biology toward behavior rather than behavior toward biology. Um, and something, um, one of my, my dear colleagues in the mentor um, Dr. Abdullah created this, and I think it's such a, such a good image to think about sort of what it is we're trying to do. So within a lot of aspects of medicine, there are relatively clear cut points or aspects where we can say, a happened causing B, and now we can expect C. So um, glycemia or blood sugar is a really good example of this. So within, um, within diabetes pathology, there are various things that can happen. Autoimmune disorders, changes in cortisol, insulin resistance, gestational things that cause a change in blood sugar. Um, when someone has a blood sugar level or an A1C that reaches a certain threshold, Generally, we know what's going to happen. The physician is going to say, oh, wow, we've got a problem here. They're going to give you some medication. They're going to recommend diet changes, probably going to tell you to exercise a bit more, and also are going to monitor really carefully for all of the sort of usual suspects, if you will, for people who have significant blood sugar problems. We can expect that people may experience neuropathy, may have cardiovascular problems, may have eye diseases, may have um, skin diseases. And within mental health, there really isn't anything like that. So what we spend a lot of time thinking about is we know that there are these various insults. So I've talked a lot about trauma and extreme stress. There may be changes to cortisol. There may be anxiety, depression, other things. Then something, something happens. And then we know that there are these outcomes or these complications that occur, that people experience depression and anxiety, hyperarousal, experience cognitive errors, but we don't know yet exactly what that marker in the middle might be or if there is such a marker. Um, we think though that chronic stress pathology may be a good place to start our examination of this. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here either, but just want to note that each individual, each and every one of us has risk factors that may contribute to our development of psychopathology should we experience a traumatic event. That may be our sex, our age, our genetics, any of these things. Um, there are also environmental risk factors. Maybe we live in a more dangerous environment. Maybe we don't have access to, to mental health care or physical health care. Uh, maybe we're witnessing violence all the time. <clears throat> And these kind of chronic stressors just, just happen. And then we find ourselves in this sort of vicious cycle where we may experience chronic stress pathology. And there are these various brain changes that I've commented on. And there are other things that happen, a lot of other things that happen in terms of other neurochemical changes, changes in things like cortisol and BDNF and NPY, and all of these things that just for the sake of time and detail, I'm, I'm not really gonna talk about today, but there are all of these changes that happen neurobiologically that then cause synaptic disconnectivity, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute, which then we think sort of relate to emotion dysregulation and cognitive impairment. 
which then relate to stress-related psychopathology and suicidality. And we sort of go round and round this circle because as you can imagine, um, for folks familiar with these symptoms, for folks who may experience these symptoms yourself, for folks who have had a loved one or a friend experience these symptoms, living day in and day out with PTSD or with depression or with suicidality is, is a really stressful, hard thing in and of itself. So we've lived through the experience of the traumatic event or extreme stressor. And then within context of PTSD, each time you're reminded about it, you kind of re-experience it a little bit. You, your body often responds with that same emotional response. You sort of reinvigorate what happens each time. The other thing we know about traumatic stress is that it often has a compounding effect and attracts more trauma and stress. So you may not only have the single experience, but continue to be re, um, re-exposed to additional stressors. And so kind of find ourselves in this vicious cycle where we go round and round with psychopathology, significantly more brain changes, more dysregulated emotion, et cetera. And so as we think about chronic stress, we think about is there, is there something, is there a common mechanism across diagnoses, something that has high comorbidity that relates to depression, to PTSD, to suicidality, is there something that responds to kind of commonly used treatments that has sort of similar biological pathways, maybe relating to gray matter deficits, things like the hippocampal volume finding, which I said is one of the most consistent findings. Excuse me. Um, and is there something that has kind of common biopsychosocial predispositions, whether that may be genetics, IQ, exposure to abuse, anything? Um, and that has a common sort of psychological pathology. So again, thinking about chronic stress. So if we think just once more about chronic stress, we know that prolonged stress does various things to the glutamatergic system, which again, I'm not gonna really discuss today, um, but ultimately causes dendritic retraction and retraction to the um, dendritic spines. And if we look at this image here on the left, excuse me, on the right, um, the, the top image that you see there shows, um, shows the synapse and the, and the dendrites um, in, a, in what we sort of call a healthy control. This is from animal studies. Um, and so this is an animal that has not been stressed, not exposed to any sort of stressor. And you can see that the, the, the spines are, are plentiful. There are a lot of them. They're fairly thick. Um, and then down on the bottom, the animal has now been stressed. And you can see that there's incredible shrinkage there, that there are not nearly as many of those lines running. There are not nearly as many of the spines coming off. And that the stress really is the cause of that synaptic disconnectivity. And so we ask ourselves, might synaptic disconnectivity be the canary in the coal mine, so to speak? Might that be a marker of psychopathology, specifically stress-related psychopathology, that might provide some insights into treating and improving the lives for people with PTSD and depression, looking at risk factors, looking at identification, at um, prevention, at treatment, and in the words of Bonnie Tyler, I sort of think I'm holding out for a hero, but thinking about how do we effectively study this in humans? There's certainly some work where um, one of our colleagues here at Yale, um, work led by Dr. Irina Estelis, has looked at some synaptic plasticity markers um, and synaptic density markers in PTSD and depression, and that work is really exciting. Um, and and I sort of wondered, are there ways that we can look at this in addition to that? Are there ways that we can explore synaptic density and synaptic um, connectivity in the absence of the PET scans and the tracers and those sorts of things? Um, and a lot of my work to date has in included ketamine studies. Um, <clears throat> I was talking with Dr. Crystal earlier, and we were discussing that, of course, all of the Avengers are uh, quite uh, 
quite large proponents of ketamine. Um, there is the additional superhero. Um, but why ketamine? Why would we think that that might be a useful thing to explore? And the reason is that ketamine, um, if folks are not familiar with ketamine, this was originally an FDA approved anti or not antidepressant, sorry, originally an FDA approved anesthetic drug, still is, um, but it was rather serendipitously found to have significant robust antidepressant effects as well, um, specifically in treatment resistant patients. And that it is what we call a RAD, a rapid acting antidepressant. Whereas most of the traditionally available antidepressants, um, things like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, tricyclics, monoamine, um, are what we call SAD, slow acting antidepressants. Um, and so there's something very exciting about ketamine that it is rapid acting. So generally people are reporting significant improvements in symptoms within 24 hours. Um, and I, I really do mean significant. If you are not familiar with ketamine, the first time that I observed the ketamine infusion and you know, sort of had read about it and been prepped for it, I thought there's absolutely no way. Like I, I've been a clinician, I've worked with people who are treatment resistant and there's no way that we're gonna see these changes. And, in, and I feel like you can, you can almost visibly see people changing and improving and getting a little bit of smile on their face and these sorts of things. Um, and certainly from the perspective of, of PTSD and especially of suicidality, um, many of the traditional antidepressants being slow acting <clears throat> do sometimes take weeks to months to actually reach full clinical benefit. So if we think about struggling with these kinds of symptoms, getting into your provider, getting a medication that, that may or may not work. For some people, they, they work fabulously. And unfortunately for many folks, they don't. But even to find out that it doesn't work or doesn't work well, you may have to wait a month or two or longer. If you're struggling with these kinds of symptoms, that's really, really an eternity. So the fact that ketamine works quickly is really exciting. Um, the fact that it can also be a interventional biomarker while also improving lives is really exciting. And what I mean by that is that we can use it as a tool to be evaluating brain changes and evaluating synaptic disconnectivity while also actually having people report significant symptom improvement. Um, <clears throat> The rest of those, I'm just for sake of time, we need to skip over. Um, we know that ketamine, both from animal studies and more recently um, from human studies, know that ketamine does improve very rapidly synaptic connectivity. So these, unfortunately, are missing the, the little labels on the bottom, but on the far left, um, you'll see a controlled, um, synapse and dendrite here that has a lot of little connections, those little white bulbs that kind of come off the side. That's what we're looking at. Um, then in the middle, the animal has been significantly stressed and you'll see that not only is the line running down the middle a little bit thinner, a little bit blurry in places, but also that the number of little bulbs that come off are significantly reduced. On the far right side, here, the animal has been administered ketamine. And again, you can see that the, the entire line has become robust again, kind of plumped up. There are more of the white bulbs that have reappeared. And again, all of this is happening generally within 24 hours. So a really fast turnaround time. Um, don't know what that's supposed to be. <laughs> um, in human studies, this was a study um, led by uh, Chadi Abdallah that was looking at the effect of ketamine in um, individuals with depression. So this is depression data, not PTSD specifically. Um, but what we see here, the red line in the back show um, sort of abnormal connectivity in brain voxels um, or what, what they should look like in, in a set of healthy control participants, so people without any diagnosis of depression, PTSD, any of those things, versus what the connectivity looks like um, in a sample in the, uh, of individuals with depression. So you can see that there's really quite a shift where the number of abnormal voxels 
is really shifted far left. Um, then here, um, the bottom graph shows what this looks like following a single administration of ketamine. So the entire group, the entire group of depressed people who responded shifted in terms of their functional connectivity to where they almost aligned perfectly with the healthy controls. And we did not see that shift in the people who did not respond to ketamine. So that suggests not only is ketamine significantly rapidly changing the um, <clears throat> changing the the connectivity, but also that it seems to really relate to treatment response, which is very valuable information for us to have. So we think again, going back, that PTSD might be a synaptic disconnection syndrome. So important to be exploring here. Um, we know um, from a study that Adriana Fetter conducted that ketamine does seem to be highly effective in individuals with PTSD. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that it is an effective rapid acting antidepressant in depression. And more recently, we've been looking at this in PTSD. Um, this just shows kind of the, <clears throat> the rapid symptom reduction from one day out until seven days with ketamine compared to an active comparator. And ketamine is um, the superior drug here. I just want to give a shout out um, for a study we're actually running that is led by Dr. John Crystal and Chadi Abdallah here at the National Center for PTSD in West Haven. Um, that's kind of a, a follow-up and expansion to Dr. Fetter's work where we are looking at ketamine for veterans with PTSD, um, specifically treatment-resistant PTSD, and exploring the safety, efficacy, and durability of effect, as well as dose response. Um, and this is a really exciting study, actually will be one of the largest ketamine studies to date, um, and certainly the largest uh, for PTSD. But if there are any veterans on the line or individuals who know veterans that may be interested in benefit, um, definitely put them in touch with us. We do have funding to, to support travel and accommodation and these kinds of things. So um, maybe an interesting opportunity. Um, we are, I have several add-on studies to that, specifically looking at ketamine for suicide. So, so as I said, not only are we able to look at the brain changes and the neurobiological changes, but we're able to do that in parallel to improving symptoms and improving lives. So there's a lot of evidence coming out that suggests ketamine has very rapid acting anti-suicidal effects which is, again, very exciting. So I have a couple of studies that we're trying to look at, not only what are the symptom changes, but what is happening in parallel um, in the brain from a structural perspective, from a functional perspective. So we'll be exploring um, cortical thickness, um, exploring functional connectivity, exploring diffusion, all of these kinds of things to try to get a better sense of what's going on. Um, so um, as that's kind of the in-progress work, what's, what's happening in parallel. Um, some upcoming things we have um, that's sort of in the pipeline is that we will be looking carefully at sex and gender differences, as well as aging differences, both in suicide, suicidal ideation and attempts, as well as in ketamine response. Um, we know certainly that within suicidality generally, there are sex and gender-based differences, as well as significant age-based differences, but we don't know exactly how those may relate to brain changes um, or to ketamine response. Um, I'm collaborating with the Department of Neurology here at the West Haven VA and will be conducting some sleep studies. Um, certainly a lot of evidence suggests that sleep is very significant in PTSD and sleep is certainly very significant in suicidality as well. So hoping that we can get some good data there um, and then hoping to collaborate a bit um, with Dr. Irina Eschelis as well, perhaps to consider some, some further PET studies to further explore synaptic strength and density in PTSD and suicidality, um, both within and without the context of ketamine specifically. Um, so just to acknowledge all of the many wonderful people who have been involved in this work, who have contributed, um, either with data, with support, with mentorship, um, any of those things. Um, a special shout out to Chadi Abdallah, John Crystal, Steve Southwick, Hillary Blumberg, and all of the A-teamers of the Emerge Research Program, um, also to the Brain and Behavior Foundation, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and the National Center for PTSD, who have provided so much support. 
um, and of course all the individuals who have participated in this study. Um, very quickly, if you've been seeing this a couple of times and wondering <laughs> what it is and what it's about, um, the Emerge Research Program is a, the research program that my colleague and mentor Chaudi Abdallah and I have created. And we, we kind of came up with the, the Phoenix in the sense of Emerge um, with the idea that we hope through our work, including these pharmacoimaging trials and studies of stress and trauma, depression and suicidality, that individuals who are struggling with these sort of stress-related psychopathologies um, may emerge from these struggles and really enjoy a happy, healthy, healthy and hopeful life. Um, and then finally, just some takeaways um, and some resources there on the side, both with information and education about PTSD, about suicide, um, both the Trevor Project, the Suicide Crisis Line and AFSP, um, have a lot of resources as well as actual crisis lines that you can call, you can text, you can chat um, if you need that support. And then there at the bottom, again, um, is the Emerge logo, um, our website, as well as my email. If you have questions, if you are interested in any of our studies or know someone that may be, please funnel them our way. Um, and I think I have rattled on for quite a while, but there may be just a couple minutes for questions. And thank you well, so much. Lynette, thank you so much, um, first of all, for sharing your and your family's experience. And I want to express my appreciation to you for all that you're doing and to your family um, for their service and sacrifice. Um, this was an outstanding presentation. And um, the work that you're doing uh, is really very exciting. And I want to yeah. just ask you, um, can, if somebody's listening and they're experiencing these symptoms that you described before in, in some detail, or there's a loved one who sees that, that their relative is experiencing these symptoms, what should they do? I think that's an excellent question. And I think, I think one of the biggest things that people can do regardless of your relationship to a person is is simply being open to to listen and to talk about it sometimes being the one to to bring it up um i know you know certainly with ptsd sometimes there's that that isolation that withdrawal that anger irritability similarly for suicidality sometimes people very much put up a front that says i don't want to talk about it don't ask me about it things are fine um and i think Sometimes we just need to, to push ourselves past that and, and say, even before we notice that maybe there's a problem, just say, I'm aware that these things exist out in the world and I am a safe, excuse me, a safe space. I am someone who, who will listen, who will support, who will help you to get whatever care or services. Um, I think there are a lot of services anymore, which is great, um, regardless of, you know, what, what sort of insurance you may have, what sort of access you may have. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of free services, and on this slide that's still up, um, the National Center for PTSD has, has an incredible amount of resources and education and information, both for, for individuals struggling with these symptoms, as well as for, for loved ones, for friends, for anything um, that range from just general what are PTSD symptoms to how do I decide what treatment is best for me? How do I talk to children about these things? Um, similar with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and, and some of these other organizations, there are a plethora of information there, not only for, you know, for people who may be struggling with these things, but also for the family and friends in terms of how do I provide support? How do I best talk about these things? How do I approach these things? Um, I think Silence definitely is not the way to go, um, though I know sometimes that's easier said than done. We, we don't want to push people. We don't want to, you know, get into fights or these kinds of things. Sometimes it feels like that make, makes things worse. Um, but I think definitely just being open and, and, and letting people know that you're there for them and that, that you're happy to support them, however that may be. Um, sometimes it may silent be. <laughs> print out a couple of things and leave it on their desk if they want to look at it, that's great. If they don't, that's great. Um, it's a really good question, though. And the, a key message is that um, people should not suffer in silence. Uh, 
they should yes. seek help and get the help that they need, get the help that they deserve, especially um, people who have served and have post-traumatic stress. The, the other thing I want to ask you about is um, often people have a mis misperception or misconception that mm -hmm. in asking about suicidal thoughts for a loved one, that they may be putting that idea into their mind when we know that asking certainly doesn't do that. In fact, it can help save a life. And I'd like you to say a few words about that. Yeah, I think um, I think that's an excellent point, Dr. Bornstein, and I think you're you're absolutely correct that there is is that thought that oh, if if I say it, if I bring it up, you know, maybe they weren't thinking about it and now they will. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that is not the case. Um, that if people were considering suicide, they were considering it, whether you mentioned it or not. Um, if they were not considering suicide, I think it is highly unlikely that you mentioning it, especially from a perspective of, of caring or concern, would be the tipping point. Um, I think absolutely, as I said, you know, I think silence is, is often the exact thing that we should not do, that, that neither us as people who may see someone seemingly struggling or as individuals who may be struggling ourselves, um, there is a lot of help and support available and definitely, you know, they, um, my, my last bullet point there, I think that research and clinical practice both are, are really progressing rapidly. We're learning an incredible amount. Um, there are new things coming. You know, um, a form of ketamine was just FDA approved. There are a lot of other things, a lot of other studies going on, looking at other sorts of treatments. Um, and so I think just just keeping in mind that there is hope, there is help, and as you said, definitely don't go it alone, definitely don't suffer in silence. There are a lot of resources available and a lot of help to be had. Um, very important points. Uh, Lynette, I want to again thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for joining us today um, to, to share this important information. Um, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations, so please consider making a contribution by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or calling us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you missed any portion or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinar page at our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Sarah Lissenby, Director of the Division of Translational Research at the National Institute of Mental Health, will present Combining Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation with Psychotherapy for Treating Depression and OCD. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, August 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care.